Welcome back to the Sermon on the Mount series. If you are just joining us, we're actually getting into Matthew chapter 6. The last five videos were about Matthew chapter 5, so if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to check those out as well. Now, before we get into this new chapter, we need to understand the nature of the person giving this sermon, which is Jesus. Now, this is what he said about himself. He who has seen me has seen the Father. This indicates to us that all the words that Jesus speaks is 100% truth sourced directly from heaven. He was the model of a flawless man presented in the midst of Israel, the one and only hope. A man whose presence was fully love, fully grace, fully truth, fully divine, which was able to overwhelm the darkness and disease. A display of righteousness by miracles that was undeniable. The Lord was finally revealed amongst the people. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The man who embodied truth boldly set straight the crooked paths. That's what happened in chapter 5. He took a verse and he put it forward and said, You think it means this, but it actually means that. By this method of teaching, Christ was renewing the mind of the people while demolishing the shoddy work of the Pharisees. Now, these are words of truth from Christ taken in by the listeners, but what about application? How was it to be put to use? Remember, truth is pointless if it's not applied by the learner. In chapter 6, Jesus will use the Pharisees' way of life as examples of hypocrisy. What he does in chapter 5 is he corrects their teachings, and in chapter 6 he moves from the teachings to the practices of the Pharisees. He brings attention to the acts that they do that seem spiritual, but in reality they're as carnal as you can get. These will be deeds that look and smell like good fruit, but really, it's just rotten. Jesus makes this very easy to grasp so that you can know if you're following God or not. Now, what he does first is he introduces the act of giving alms, which is to sacrifice your sustenance to honor the life of another. In this passage, God contrasts godly giving with godless giving. So listen very carefully to what he says. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. If your deeds are done seeking man's approval, you will not have God's approval. At heart, you must truly be seeking God alone. The great indicator that this is so is not to care if anyone saw you giving or not. Anyone who gives in secret reveals that they truly believe in an ever-present God and isn't seeking man's applause. Based on that situation, it just kind of goes without saying. They're replicating the selfless love of the Father in their hearts. What other drive would a man have to give in secret? There really is a lot to gain when you give in front of a crowd. Now, a hypocrite is actually searching for a crowd before he performs his deeds because he would rather receive worship than give it to God. He doesn't actually care for the poor, but merely wishes to appear as if he does in exchange for elevation in societal status. Godless giving is giving with expectation of being repaid. A worldly man will give with his right hand in order to receive with his left. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That your charitable deed may be done in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. A godly giver gives like Christ. He gave blessings that were impossible for man to repay. He knew that, yet he freely gave anyway, and so should we. Lend to all freely, just as God freely gives you your daily needs. A godly giver will be rewarded in the fullness of time. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Giving of your time and resources to strengthen the hand of another in love is not the only thing God will reward. He also rewards prayer, believe it or not. 
However, prayer is another one of those deeds that can be done in a shameful manner if it's done in hypocrisy. These types of prayers are not directed toward God at all, even though it appears as if it is. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. These religious men who are only interested in building the clout they have in the community are pursuing a stage with a gathering. They're not going to bother praying alone because they're not actually looking for God. It would make no sense for them to pray alone. It's not their goal. Now, once a hypocrite finds a stage to perform on, they will give the most elegant prayer you've ever heard. Now, this isn't the case every time, but usually those with an appetite for accolades will use godly sounding inflections, pious wording, and they'll deliver their prayers in a sophisticated way. Prayer will have been tailor-made and rehearsed to tickle ears. The crowds will ooh and ah over the level of holiness that was just dispensed into the atmosphere, and yet the prayer wasn't even to God. It's not praying out of a deep relational connection to the Lord, but rather is disingenuous and bestowed solely upon the assembly and that's as far as it was purposed to go. It has a form of godliness, but lacks belief. The unbeliever praying these prayers will have the glory of man poured upon him for a season, but that's it. That is their hope, non-eternal things, things that fade away. The praise and glory that man can give you ceases just as they soon will. Hopes placed in mortals die with them all the promise of their power comes to nothing. God is able to promise gifts that are indefinite. However, he will not award these eternal gifts to prayers that aren't directed toward him. These false prayers that ooze virtue signaling, he disregards. This pretend excess of righteousness is actually deep wickedness and should be completely avoided. Guard your heart against this. Do this instead. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Praying in private is the same concept Christ was using for the giving of alms. Anytime we do these things in secret, we are almost certainly doing them to and for God. All the great saints of the past, including Christ himself, sought solitude when praying to the Father because our relationship with God should be personal, genuine, and sacred. Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. In the early morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness and pray. All of these men were great examples of seeking a rich, quiet time with the Lord. And it's what every real believer will be found doing. Okay, so the last point Jesus makes in this passage is this. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. When he tells us not to use vain repetitions, he's referring to a common pagan practice that was used by many different religions at the time, even now. What is done is that a specific word or phrase is repeated over and over again in one sitting in an attempt to gain the ear of the divinity. Some use this technique for self-improvement, as a daily habit to calm the mind. They call this prayer, but it isn't. This is a ritual. The difference between a ritual and a prayer is a ritual is a passive procedure and a prayer is an engaged relationship. Just imagine for a second if you used ritual to communicate with your spouse or a friend. You use the same phrase or word over and over and over. Would mutual trust be exchanged like this? Would comfort and strength be cultivated for specific needs and challenges in life? I would imagine that this would be extremely offensive to the other person, and God's the same way. 
He's not a lamp that you have to rub just right to get a response. He knows your needs intimately before you even ask. Do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. He provides for you every day. He cares for you even if you're not aware of it. Trust that he always sees and hears even the silent utterances of your heart. Believe that he is compassionate towards his creation and holds our best interest in his responses. These types of prayers are the meaningful ones. The believer already knows of the intimate knowledge God has of all people. Heartaches and the difficult situations are already laid bare before God. This is the time when hearts should be poured out to him or real life struggles that should be shared with your father. When the raw nature of our burdens should be cast at the feet of our comforter and friend. There's no room to be fake with God. The truth is there is no hiding anything from him. And anyone who knows the Lord will know that. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the intro into chapter 6, and if you did, please leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss the next video about the Lord's Prayer. God bless.